fatalities, including a New York City firefighter. Some of the walking wounded were able to leave Bellevue this afternoon, bruised and dirty, but lucky to be alive. This elevator repairman who survived the first World Trade Center bombing ran out, tools still in hand. The building collapsed safe, got a lot of smoke. You breathe in a lot of smoke? A lot of smoke, they check out. It take time, you know. But thank God, second time in my life I survived. Bellevue began mobilizing soon after the explosions. Doctors, nurses, even medical students ready to staff the emergency room. There have been two fatalities among the more than 120 victims transported here, but many of the injured have been taken to several area hospitals. Still, as a level one trauma center, doctors expect to see many more serious injuries. We're going to see probably very, very critical patients with tremendous crush injuries, tremendous traumatic injuries as they explore the area and find uh, people in this disastrous place. Among those near the scene, the head of the Health and Hospitals Corporation, whose car was nearly crushed by debris, he says a battery of grief counselors are ready. We know that many, probably thousands of people that were physically okay will not be mentally okay, that they will have to deal with various, very serious uh, traumatic experience where this uh, uh, images will repeat themselves. The hospital has put out an urgent plea for blood donations, particularly type O negative, the universal donor. Throughout the day, hundreds of New Yorkers lined up to volunteer, including Jeff Lanka, who was in the 28th floor of Two World Trade, but made it out. My life was spared, so let me give back. And I, Bellevue, I think, is the closest to Penn Station. I walked over, and uh, now I'm here. You consider yourself lucky, huh? Thank you, yeah, I do. I do. Now, as for the blood situation, they are starting to turn people away, actually, from Bellevue Hospital because they processed as many people as they can for the next 12 hours, but they say that does not eliminate the need. There are places in the city that you can still donate. Also, a phone number has been set up. If you, have, uh, if you think you ha might have a loved one at Bellevue Hospital, there is a phone number for families to call. That number, 212-562-7696. Uh, Once again, 562-7696. That's the latest from Bellevue Hospital. Marcus Solis, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Several ways you can help. Thank you, Marcus Solis at Bellevue Hospital. We want to tell you that a moment ago when Jeff Rossman was giving his report about a collapse or some type of commotion which is creating a huge dust cloud, that was indeed there telling us from upstairs, Seven World Trade Center, a 47-tall tower which has collapsed. It had been evacuated earlier today and was on fire, and firefighters were just trying to contain that blaze at the time that it came down. 47 stories. Okay, we have told you throughout this broadcast that there is a shortage of blood, and we want to give you a number that you can call. Our eyes trying to, from the dust clouds that are coming, if you can see behind me this a moment ago, you could see all the way through, but from that last explosion that Jeff Rossin was telling us about, it is now again dark. It was strangely and eerily calm here in the financial district because everything's been evacuated. Of course, now that calm is being punctuated again by emergency units ferrying people back from the scene, they are still pulling the injured out from the rubble. These are the latest numbers from Beekman Hospital. 3,300 casualties, 20% of those are critical. Three, unfortunately, dead on arrival, 20% critical. They are seeing... NJN News is made possible by PSENG. I, I hate to sound like I'm obsessing on this, but I, I just think that we can't let lose sight of it for a moment. The huge number of people that undoubtedly died here. Won't there be a, an almost unstoppable cry for uh, a pound, if not a ton, of flesh over this? John, um, no nation can allow this kind uh, of cowardly terrorist act of this enormity, this immensity, as you mentioned, to go uh, unpunished. Uh, we will get the facts. We will be sure of those facts. And when we have those facts, uh, we will do something about it. Now, one of the things that might come out of this, John, is a, a new coalition of the civilized world focusing, putting the resources on dealing with terrorism. As great a power as the United States is, as we found out today, we can't do this alone. We need all the civilized world with us. And we need to deal with this. This issue, terrorism, is the scourge of our time. Senator Chuck Hagel, thanks very much uh, for uh, the latest uh, from uh, 
your uh, vantage point. Let's go now to Rear Admiral Eric McVaden of the Institute for Policy Analysis, uh, who joins us from Washington. Uh, Mr. McVaden, we're, we all want to know who, how, why, and what to do about it. Uh, where can you start? Well, I think you've identified just exactly the problem. Of course, a lot of people are asking, so how do we strike back? Uh, how do we both defend the U.S.? And by the way, I don't think we've seen F-16s and F-15s flying over the Washington area like this ever Nor in my over lifetime. downtown Manhattan, I'll right. remind you. Indeed. Uh, but what I think we're looking at in, in the coalition that Senator Hagel spoke of is an intelligence challenge, and maybe we need that sort of concerted effort among all of the civilized world there. But I think we have an intelligence uh, challenge now at two levels. First, uh, to uh, just exactly as you described it, uh, to say who did it, but then to be able to uh, be able to determine whether they're going to be future attacks or what the future threats are. Well, Admiral, there, there's two approaches to this. You figure out who, and then you say, do we take the cuddly approach? Why are they mad at us, and how can we make them happy with us? Or do we take the opposite approach and say, we hit them, hit them hard, make them so frightened of ever doing such a thing again that it doesn't happen. What's the approach? Well, I don't know what the approach is because you've identified the dilemma exactly. And, you know, let me describe it in terms that the Chinese often do with me in North Korea. And so what you should do is be able to get along with the North Koreans better and you would eliminate the threat. Well, that's much easier said than done. I think it's a balance between the two and that we'll have to cope with that uh, for uh, all uh, the time that I can foresee. Uh, Admiral Linda Vester with you as well. Yes. Just a question about uh, what it means that the Pentagon and, uh, and actually, as we understand, naval forces along the entire East Coast are under threat con Delta. Can you explain? Well, that's simply going to the highest state of alert so that we attempt to both be ready to cope with anything, but also uh, for force protection means and so that we ensure that we do not get yet another very unpleasant surprise. Right. So we have multiple Navy ships now dispatched some of them to the New York Harbor to help with a rescue. How much training do those aboard those ships have for this kind of incident? Well, uh, of course, I've heard that there might be a hospital ship that's going, and so that would certainly have something there. But uh, yes, people are trained to cope with emergencies and so forth, but I uh, guess I take some pleasure if there could be any such thing derived in this kind of situation to know that once again, the country looks around and says, where are our aircraft carriers? So it makes me proud of my years in the U.S. Navy. Yeah. All right, uh, Rear Admiral Eric McVaden, thanks very much for joining us. You may want to stay on the line and listen to this. We're going now to our, our senior correspondent in Washington, Rita Cosby, who has new information on the possible Osama bin Laden connection. Rita. Yeah, John, I just got off the phone with two law enforcement sources, and they are telling me that they are getting strong indications that Osama bin Laden and his organization of al-Qaeda, which is based in Afghanistan along with bin Laden, may be behind this attack. What's interesting is that they're saying, my sources, are that they have strong indicators. They would not say specifically what those indicators are, but they're saying it's much more than just speculation. When a lot of people have believed that bin Laden may have been tied just because he had the financial resources to do this, the capability, the widespread network all over the globe. But my sources are telling me that in addition to just the obvious, that they are getting some severe and very strong indicators pointing in that direction. Um, they're saying that at this point it is not enough to be, you know, to go right out and say that they definitely did that. But they're saying that they are uh, almost to the point where they are almost certain that they are behind this attack. Rita, if I can ask you a question about this. Uh, we, we, are all, we don't know any details, but we're, we're all making a fairly informed um, estimate that, uh, that it was not the scheduled pilot that flew these planes into the trade towers or the Pentagon. Who? who in Osama bin Laden's world can train people to fly 757s. Well, there are actually a number of them, frighteningly. And in fact, um, intelligence sources were telling me earlier today that they actually have a couple of training grounds right there in Afghanistan where they are training suicide bombers for planes, i.e. 737s, 757s, 767s, also private planes, and also other types of bombing attacks. And of course, intelligence sources firmly believe he's been behind the USS Cole attack. That was where a small boat pulled up alongside the USS Cole and it exploded. But they said that they have gotten some intelligence information that he was indeed training people on some American commercial jetliners um, and that he was capable of doing this. And in fact, I remember around the time of the Millennium Strikes, remember all the preparations that were being made and the strikes that were thwarted by U.S. officials at that point, there was uh, in the mix 
the possibility that there might be multiple hijackings on U.S. soil, and it would have involved some Algerians with ties to Osama bin Laden. So this is something that the U.S. government was aware that uh, Osama bin Laden had been training for, at least in some sort of capability. They, no one I've spoken to today ever anticipated that it would actually happen. They all seem to be taken very much by surprise that something would have happened on U.S. soil. But they certainly did know that he was training individuals. And also law enforcement sources also tell me that they, in addition to this, saw some activity around bin Laden's camp in the last two weeks. And this was the same type of activity that we were reporting right around the time of the possible millennium strikes, that they saw increased activity around his camps, um, where he was sending out some of his leaders, the ones right below him, to sort of delegate to other surrogates around the globe. What happens with Osama bin Laden, his network is so widespread that normally it's about four or five, sometimes six or seven layers away from him are the actual individuals who carry out the attacks, and often they don't know who they're carrying out the attacks for. So they try to keep it so Osama bin Laden doesn't point directly to him. He never claims responsibility for his acts, and they seem to think the same thing may have taken place here. Um, but indeed, right before the Millennium attacks, they certainly saw a lot of activity around his camp. Some of his key men were being dispatched to different locations around the globe, and they said that, indeed, they did see at least some activity around his camps in the last week and a half, two weeks, and some indications. Another thing we reported earlier today, on June 20th of this year, Osama bin Laden's followers released a videotape of Osama bin Laden saying that he's going to hit, it where, hit them where it hurts. And they talked about hitting targets in U.S., also and in Israel. So there were some indications that he was going to go after his followers, go at, rather go after his enemies, and go after them with a vengeance. Um, but now I'm being told, John, from law enforcement sources, that it is much more than just sort of the sense that he was capable of carrying out this attack, that he had obviously the financial resources, certainly the infrastructure around the globe, right. but that they are getting strong indicators pointing uh, in that direction. Right now, not 100 percent, but getting strong indicators pointing there. Rita Cosby, if you would stand by, we have more information coming in. We've gotten word that there's a convoy of military vehicles in Washington, D.C., Passing through the section of Washington known as Georgetown, working their west, their way west, uh, headed towards Georgetown. No indication as to what exactly they're planning to do, but uh, that just coming in, being confirmed. Also, this President Bush is due to speak to the nation uh, a little bit later tonight. At this moment, he is in the air, heading back to Washington from Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. That is where he stopped. He touched down. He held a, a uh, National Security Council meeting via telephone. And then he gave this statement before getting back on the plane and heading to Washington. Take a, Washington rather. Take a look. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. And freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. And we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake, 
we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President George W. Bush now on his way to Washington, D.C. He will address the nation a little bit later tonight, the time to be determined, but you will see it here live on the Fox News Channel. Linda, the uh, president talking about the victims, one of the victims we know by name, uh, Barbara Olson, who appeared on this network many times, uh, it is now being reported on the wires that she spoke to her husband, Theodore Olson, twice during the hijacking using her cell phone, and she told her husband that the hijackers were using knife-like instruments, um, and they further declined to describe the conversation. Barbara Olson killed today in the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. Joining me on the phone now, Colonel David Hackworth, uh, America's most decorated living soldier. Colonel Hackworth, uh, America wants, evidently wants to go to war about this. How do we do that? Well, you know, having lived through Pearl Harbor and remembering that terrible day, and, and the end result of that is how it galvanized the nation. And I suspect that all Americans will come and stand tall and will finally get uh, the national security apparatus, that's the generals, the admirals, the president, and all of the people that are responsible for the security of this country, to get their heads out of a very dark place and start waking up. I have for 10 years, John, even on your show we talked about, said the threat is terrorism. In the meantime, we build uh, defense shields for the, to stop missiles and buy more bombs and more aircraft, but not address the problem. While the FBI goes almost barefooted, who are the mainline defenders in this thing, while our intelligence community doesn't get the kind of money and the funding and the, and the uh, backup that they need to, to do the job to, to stop terrorism, we're preparing again for a 20th century war in the 21st century. Colonel Hackworth, are, are you saying that we should be... Uh, hold on, Colonel Hackworth. Hillary Clinton is speaking now. Let's, uh, let's uh, listen to the senator from I New York. I can't wait. All right, hang Hillary on a second, Colonel. I are here today to express our solidarity with the people in New York and America. First, we completely are appalled, shaken, but also resolute as a result of this awful action. This is Pearl Harbor, 21st century, and it, it's an unknown enemy, although they will be known, attacking civilians. First to the families of those who may have losses and so many, so many calls we received today from people who couldn't find loved ones, didn't know where they were. We feel your pain, I know, for an hour I couldn't find my daughter, whose high school is in the shadow of the World Trade Center. And praise God, I was able to find her and she and my wife, who works downtown in New York, and my other daughter are safe. So our first feeling is for the families and the suffering and the pain that goes on in New York and throughout the country. I spoke on behalf of us to the president this afternoon. He wished me to convey to New Yorkers that he will do everything possible to help the rescue and the recovery and what needs to be done in future years and months because this loss is just a terrible loss that will not go away soon. We all, he also expressed the second point which we share and that is that those who did this must be brought to justice. For too often too long the world has just shrugged its shoulders at terrorism. But we now know that none of us as Americans can avoid that terrorism unless we take strong action against it. And I express to the President on behalf of both of us and all of the Senate that we stand shoulder to shoulder with him in this fight. That no one will try to seek partisan or geographic or any other advantage we will be united in this fight. 
and we will do everything we can. We cannot have a month-long or a year-long fight against terrorism. We have to have a permanent fight against terrorism because this is the new form of warfare. And so the few things we ask people, first for prayers, second anyone in America who can through their local authorities give blood, we are desperately short of blood. We need doctors who can contact the authorities if they live within a days of New York. We are short of doctors. And of course, FEMA and the urban rescue teams, as many as our nation has, are being sent immediately. Uh, America can never turn back from this point. And we are in a new era where we realize the world is an interconnected but sometimes very nasty place. We have to be prepared for it. And so, two things. One, love and caring for those who accepted loss and help for those who need some path to recovery. And second, resoluteness that we will never let this happen again and do everything we can, and some of the steps won't be easy to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, Chuck and I wish we could be in New York, um, but that's not possible. And we've been in constant communication with the authorities, uh, with the White House, the governor's office, the mayor's office, with the emergency officials. And I think that it's clear to everyone this was an attack on America. It may have been directed uh, at New York, but it really is attack, attacking everything we stand for in every part of our country. And I'm very proud of the way New Yorkers responded. Uh, the behavior of the people um, on the ground, the emergency uh, resources, our police and, and firefighters have just been extraordinary and many of them uh, were put in harm's way because they were doing their job. Our medical facilities, all the hospitals in the immediate area are overwhelmed. Uh, we are moving uh, non-critical patients out of uh, hospitals in the city, out to Long Island, even Westchester, in order to make room for uh, those who have been injured. Uh, we do need more blood. We need doctors and nurses and other medical uh, professionals who would be able to uh, support uh, those who are working uh, so tirelessly. Uh, we appreciate the federal resources, certainly the uh, search and rescue teams, the National Guard, uh, FEMA. Uh, we've been assured we will have everything we need uh, to conduct the various phases of the reaction. First, of course, is to find any who might have survived. Second is to find every body of anyone who has not, to do the hard work of sifting for evidence, and then for the task of rebuilding. Uh, this will be a monumental undertaking. This was a nerve center of communications, of infrastructure that affects uh, not just our nation, but the entire world in terms of the access to and transfer of information. We're also deeply concerned about the attack on the Pentagon. Uh, we just had a conference call with our congressional, our Senate leadership, uh, bipartisan, uh, Senators Daschle and Reed and Lott and Nichols. Uh, we also heard from Senator Warner. He and Senator Levin are at the Pentagon where uh, they have gone to uh, um, do everything they can to support what needs to be done, and they were certainly very confident that uh, you know our military forces are as alert and ready as they need to be. Uh, so there is uh, an enormous amount of very uh, good, solid work being done in New York, in Washington, throughout the country. Uh, I would just reiterate there is absolutely no need for anyone anywhere to panic. Uh, this has been carried out in an orderly and effective manner, uh, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. And that work includes uh, the identifying uh, of those who are responsible 
for this cowardly and evil act and holding them accountable wherever they might be, however long it would take. Do we have any questions? idea who is responsible for these attacks? I think they do, and uh, they're not prepared to say yet, but uh, I have spoken to both FBI and CIA today, and they are certainly not clueless. We step away uh, we from Senators from Schumer and Clinton President to give you some new information. We are expecting a number of briefings very shortly. One from the mayor of New York City. Also, in about 15 minutes from now, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, is due to brief in Washington. Shortly before 7 p.m. Eastern Time, the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, and possibly other members of the Cabinet will also brief. They will be at the FBI building in Washington, D.C. With that, we want to let you know what is happening in New York City. The National Guard has been called out to the lower Manhattan Manhattan trying to help with the rescue. It appears that hundreds of police and firefighters are missing from the ranks of those who were sent in to respond to the first crash. We go now to correspondent David Lee Miller, who is near one of the buildings that has just collapsed. David? Linda, we're on uh, Church Street, and this really is ground zero, only a few blocks away from what was once the World Trade Center. The attack began a little over nine hours ago, and just a few minutes ago, we saw further proof of its devastation. We have some incredible videotape that we should be taking a look at right now. This is number seven World Trade Center. And as you can see, this building that authorities feared throughout the day might collapse did so just a few minutes ago. It uh, fell in the opposite direction of the World Trade Center. It fell in a southerly direction. And when it did, a huge plume of black smoke went up. Authorities anticipated that. We were warned it might happen. They gave us special masks to wear. They were wearing these special uh, uh, face masks. but. Uh, as the uh, plume of smoke began to grow larger and in our direction, they asked us to relocate, and authorities moved us uh, up north about a block and a half. And uh, now what was once building number seven is also gone. The New York City skyline dramatically changed in just now the last few hours. Now, as for how many people may have died, we still do not have uh, anywhere near an estimate. We do know, according to the mayor of New York, 200 people critically injured, 600 now in the hospital. Countless, countless victims still trapped in the rubble, authorities having a very difficult time getting to them. It is believed that it could take now up to one week before authorities really get an accurate measure of how many people died in this tragedy. As proof of the panic, if you go downtown here on Church Street in front of what was once the World Trade Center, you can see that women's shoes, high-heeled shoes, litter the street. People in a panic, desperate to flee, abandoned their shoes and just ran away from the devastation as quickly as they could. For a while, even the mayor of New York York. Mayor Giuliani was trapped in a nearby building for 10 minutes on uh, 75 Barclay Street when the two buildings collapsed when he was here to inspect the damage. Now, at this hour, we have seen emergency crews arrive. I saw just a parade of all types of emergency vehicles. The National Guard is here. And Linda and John, one of the National Guardsmen, made a very interesting point that up until now, I certainly did not realize today's date, he said, 9-1-1. Back to you. David, uh, the video... Line up. We can see the pictures coming to us by the video phone. Again, this is very advanced technology that CNN is using, but you will see some of the digital effect. It is not quite as clear as your average television signal, and so to our viewers, we apologize okay. for that. But this is certainly the only video that you're going to get from Kabul, Afghanistan at this point, and you're watching it on CNN. Again, we are hearing from our correspondent, Nick Robertson, who is on the scene in Kabul with his team there, and he has reported the sounds of tracer fire. He has reported the fire burning there in Kabul, the seat of Afghanistan's power, the seat of its Taliban government. Uh, again, we are watching their picture coming to us on the video phone, and it is very hard, of course, to see exactly what you're looking at. But you are looking at Kabul. Again, you see some tracer fire there coming across the scene. Nick Robertson, can you, yeah. can you Joey, hear us? We're being, we're being told, jo Joey, I, Joey, I can, Joey, I can hear you if you can hear me. Certainly, big detonation there, missiles flying across the city. We're being told from sources in Kandahar, that's the spiritual capital of Afghanistan, 300 miles south of here, that there is uh, no uh, rocket activity like this south of here in Kandahar. Certainly in Kabul, very, very active at this stage. Multiple detonations. It is nighttime here. It is dark. It is difficult to get an accurate fix on exactly what we're seeing and exactly what we're hearing. Certainly the sound, what appears to be the sound of large missiles incoming and landing in the city. Certainly a big fire on the horizon of the city at the moment. 
uh, and certainly anti-aircraft fire uh, coming up from the city and rockets being launched uh, and flying across the horizon of the city. Uh, rockets perhaps going at the speed of uh, several hundred miles an hour, the sort of speed that one might expect to see uh, cruise missiles traveling across the horizon at burning with a, a white glow coming from their tails rather than, rather than a yellow glow. The fire on the uh, horizon that we can see from here burning furiously now. Uh, perhaps it would be accurate at this stage to suspect that that was a fuel dump that's been hit uh, by the way that it's burning, flames leaping, and that fuel dump must be perhaps five to eight miles from where I am. Flames leaping up from that fuel dump now leaping up right into the air. Um, it was a low burning fire before, but it has now really increased in its ferocity, perhaps indicating that it is a fuel dump. Looking across the rest of the city, uh, that fuel dump, perhaps the only big fire we can see at this time. From our vantage point here at the Kabul Intercontinental Hotel that overlooks the whole of the city of Kabul, that is in a basin surrounded by mountains, uh, the, the whole city is laid out in front of us. The gunfire that was coming up from the city seems to have subsided for now. We're not hearing any more detonations at this moment. And as I say, the fire on the horizon really burning uh, furiously at this time, flames leaping way up in the air this moment. Joey? Nick, if you can talk to us a little bit about your circumstance. It is 6 o'clock in the evening here in Atlanta. It must be quite late at night there in Kabul. Indeed, 2.30 uh, in the morning uh, here, Joey, we're eight and, a, eight and a half hours ahead of East Coast time in the United States. Uh, and it was about uh, five hours ago that the Foreign Minister of Afghanistan, Ahmed uh, Wakil, Ahmed Mutawakil, briefed journalists. I hear more detonations going off now. Um, he said that the Taliban had not taken precautions against uh, the like against the possibility uh, of there being an air attack against afghanistan he said because it was not necessary uh, the taliban spiritual leader mullah omar had also made a statement saying that they felt osama bin laden wasn't responsible for what had happened in the united states he said his country was a peaceful country he wanted it to be at peace and he wanted uh, peace in other countries around the world certainly what we're seeing in kabul uh, in these early hours of this wednesday morning it is very far from peace. Uh, certainly, multiple explosions happening in and around the city. We, there is a front line uh, about 50 miles north of the city where the uh, Taliban are fighting a, a battle against the, uh, the Northern Alliance here. We could hear detonations coming from that uh, northern area as well. But on the perimeter of the city, particularly in the direction of the Kabul airport, which is about five to eight miles from where we are, detonations coming from there. I remember standing on this balcony about four years ago watching, uh, watching fighter jets bomb that airport as part of Afghanistan's ongoing civil war. The uh, flash uh, at the airport to uh, us hearing the detonation at the hotel is about the same duration. So I, I am using that as an estimate uh, to gauge that those missiles again are falling in the area of the airport. First, we're seeing the flash and then we hear the detonation some several seconds afterwards, and they appear to be coming from that airport area, in some cases uh, several miles away from us. There is still uh, a lot of flashing uh, we can see in the air reflected off clouds. That could be thunder and lightning. However, there's a possibility that those reflections and missiles landing elsewhere, uh, the flashes as they explode and reflecting off the clouds. But it's not a good indication. We certainly don't hear uh, any detonations coming from that particular direction at this time. Um, the anti-aircraft fire that we were seeing a little while ago is not uh, coming up from the city. The city, uh, apart from the detonations we were hearing a few minutes ago, appears very, very calm. The visibility here is excellent. We can see all the way across the city. It lies on a plain that's surrounded by the mountains here in Kabul. We have high mountains to the right. These mountains were used by the Mujahideen as vantage points for shelling the city uh, several years ago during the Mujahideen in fighting in Kabul. The last five years, the Taliban have been in control of this city, have been trying to extend their control over and across Afghanistan. And the foreign minister this evening uh, telling journalists and CNN that he didn't believe that the Afghanistan would be attacked. 
He said if Afghanistan was attacked, then they would call it, the Taliban would call it an act of state-sponsored terrorism, Joey. All right, that is CNN's Nick Robertson. Again, please keep the line open to us, Nick Robertson, there in Kabul, Afghanistan, for our viewers who are watching this with us on the air. Again, this is we're getting this from video phone technology. You're seeing this exclusively on CNN. It is a very new technology, and so you, you could tell from the audio line, it is not as clear as our typical TV feed, and the visuals obviously are not as clear, but you are looking at the city of Kabul in Afghanistan. This is the seat uh, of, the, uh, of the Taliban government, they are not its spiritual center, but its government center in any case. Uh, you are seeing in just about the last 10 minutes, we have been hearing these reports from CNN correspondent Nick Robertson on the ground in Kabul of an explosion. You see on the right side of your screen, about a third of the way over, the flames of fire. They were quite large just a short time ago. Seemed to have simmered down, but again, we're just not seeing very much of this because it's uh, the video phone. Again, Nick Robertson saying that they had seen tracers going up as well. Uh, they have been listening and hearing the possibility of additional explosions elsewhere. They're trying to follow that, but it's a little bit hard to tell. Again, it is 2.30 in the morning in Kabul. And uh, Nick Robertson continues to watch there. Now let's turn to Judy Woodruff for us in Washington. Judy. Joey, we are in the studio in Washington, but of course riveted uh, to these pictures uh, coming out of Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, with me in the studio watching former United States Defense Secretary William Cohen and uh, Republican Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah. Uh, both, I want to ask both of you about what's going on. Let me begin with you, uh, Secretary Cohen. Is this something that is likely to be the United States retaliating, which is what I think immediately comes to people's minds? I think we have to be very uh, cautious in coming to that uh, judgment, Judy. Um, what we're looking at now is the United States gathering uh, information and intelligence. Obviously, there are many plans and contingency plans uh, that we have to deal with uh, responding uh, to any potential uh, terrorist threat that might be in the offing again. But I think it's uh, very premature to make any judgment on this. This could be a part of the civil war that's been raging on for some time. And so I think we have to wait to get more information. What do you mean part of a civil war? Well, there's been a civil war raging in uh, Afghanistan for some time now, and this could be simply uh, the factions still carrying on their fighting in, uh, in Kabul, uh, rather than any kind of an attack being launched by the United States. Are you saying, uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, that it's unlikely that the United States would move this quickly? Uh, I'm asking that because just a few minutes ago I was interviewing former Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger, and he said flat out what the United States needs to do is strike against countries like Afghanistan that are harboring terrorists and not wait to find out exactly who was responsible for today's atrocities? Well, I think we do have to uh, isolate uh, and ostracize those countries like Afghanistan and others who are on the terrorist list who will give uh, safe harbor uh, for, for terrorists. But I think we have to be a little more uh, judicious uh, rather than simply striking out. We have to get uh, more information and uh, further strikes might be uh, warranted. But at this point, I think we get all the information, then make a very a cold, ice cold decision in terms of what uh, we need to do to protect the American people and make sure that this uh, doesn't happen again. But I think that uh, may be a bit premature at this point. Senator Hatch, again, we're stressing we have no idea who's behind these attacks in Kabul, uh, the uh, government uh, center of Afghanistan. But if this were the West, if this were the United States, would it be appropriate to retaliate so quickly? Well, we have some information. You know, about a month ago, we had information that, there were, that they were planning on some big strikes, people who were affiliated or associated with bin Laden. Then uh, just today, uh, we've intercepted some information where some people who are associated with bin Laden basically said that uh, they had uh, hit two targets. So it looks to me like uh, there's, uh, there's increasing evidence, even though it's fragmentary and even though it's not positive, that uh, bin Laden uh, is behind all this. And of course, uh, I first warned the nation in 1996 on Meet the Press right. that we better get hold of bin Laden or he's going to kill Americans. We're going to bring back our Nick Robertson there on uh, the ground in, or I should say on top of a building there in Kabul. Nick, uh, you're on. Go. Well, certainly the fire we were watching on the horizon before, I'd made the assumption that it was an oil depot burning because we've certainly seen flames, uh, a, a dull yellow fire turn into a bright 
orange fire with flames leaping into the sky. I've been informed by my uh, associates here who work with us in Kabul that it's very likely an ammunition dump that we're looking at. They believe an ammunition dump is located in that area. That, of course, would account for some of the explosions that we've been hearing here as ammunition has detonated and gone off from that location, Judy. Yeah. Certainly it's all quiet here in Kabul right yeah. now. Certainly no more explosions are being heard around the city. And I believe, we certainly believe what we're looking at now is an ammunition dump, the fire at that dump now dying down, and we're hearing no more detonations coming from that dump. Certainly, uh, Kabul is within striking range of some of the long-range missiles that the Northern Alliance has and is capable of uh, capable of, uh, of launching in this direction. And certainly, in the past, the Northern Alliance has launched missiles at Kabul. It is not without the realms of possibility that the Northern Alliance could launch missiles at this time. The Northern Alliance, in the last couple of days, has gone through a rather traumatic process of an assassination attempt on its key leader, um, Ahmed Shah Massoud, still unconfirmed whether that leader is alive or dead. And certainly uh, there's a ferocity within the, within the internal fighting in, going on in Afghanistan at this time. One certainly cannot rule out that any missiles falling on the city tonight could be coming from that northern alliance. So, uh, Nick Robertson, just to clarify, you're saying it could well be uh, at part of an internal, a civil war uh, that we see here and not a result of something coming from uh, the West, NATO, the United States. From our vantage point this evening, we can certainly report a large number of explosions around the city, what appears to be an ammunition dump on fire, a lot of return fire coming up from positions in Kabul, we cannot say from this uh, position at this time exactly where the missiles are coming from, those causing the detonations in and around the city of Kabul. Uh, it is possible it's from the Northern Alliance, and of course there is the other possibility uh, that we've been talking about this evening. And Nick, is this typical of the kind of... Uh, oh, this uh, time because we have moved. A small group of us now are the first to be let in back to the White House. I have just uh, cleared security, and uh, you know the walk. I'm walking down the, uh, through the northwest gate into the driveway, looking straight at the west wing as we speak. So a small group of press now being allowed back in here to the White House. What's odd, Brian, is that tonight, a little while from now, there was supposed to be a joyous and gala barbecue on the South Lawn, a barbecue for uh, Congress uh, put on by President Bush. Obviously, that is not going to happen. Uh, the president himself was out of town today and kept out of town for a good while. Uh, first in Nebraska, or rather first to a Louisiana Air Force uh, facility, and then to a Nebraska Air Force base from where he will uh, come back here to the White House. Uh, also, for that matter, the congressional leaders, we're told, were also spirited out of town to uh, protect them. Um, I can tell you, Brian, we made a uh, seven-block walk from um, the FBI building on 10th Street up here to the White House on 17th. It was and rema it remains a ghost town in Washington. You could look down one of the major streets and see nothing but traffic lights and white lines, no cars. In one case, we saw a big fuel tanker truck escorted by two police cars moving quickly down one of the main streets. Uh, as you know, President Bush today has uh, spoken about this uh, uh, attack on the United States twice, calling it a national tragedy, calling the incidents cowardly acts and uh, terrorism against the United States, which he says will not stand. Here's a bit of what President Bush had to say in a statement this afternoon. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. 
Brian, back here at the White House now. Again, a small group of us being allowed in, uh, awaiting, we think, what will be a statement from President Bush after he arrives here. Uh, a parting uh, thought for you. One of the sights that was uh, utterly unreal here today was in the skies above the White House and the National Mall in Washington on at least three or four occasions uh, one could look up and see fighter jets crisscrossing in the sky. Uh, Bob Kerr back inside the White House after a day outside the White House. And for those just joining us, that is indeed Lower Manhattan you were looking at earlier. What's different about the skyline? The World Trade Center, the landmark Twin Towers, both gone. The death toll is staggering. So many people from all walks of life, and it is destined to grow throughout the evening and throughout the days ahead. Among those who died is Barbara Olson. She had a long career in public service, was a television commentator, and the wife of the U.S. Solicitor General, Ted Olson. Barbara Olson, a frequent contributor on NBC News broadcast, was 45. She was on board the plane that crashed at the Pentagon today. For more on the four different commercial aircraft that were hijacked, we go to NBC News correspondent Jim Cummins at American Airlines headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas tonight. Jim, good evening. Good evening, Brian. That's right. It was outrageous and audacious. Hijacking four commercial airliners, two 757s, Boeing 757s, two Boeing 767s, fully loaded with fuel and using them as weapons. They were loaded with fuel for cross-country flights and then using them as weapons against the U.S. First, there was American Flight 11, which was scheduled to go from Boston to Los Angeles this morning. 81 passengers aboard, nine flight attendants, two pilots. It was then diverted to New York, where it, uh, it hit the South Tower, plowed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center at 8.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Next, United Flight 175, also bound from Boston to L.A., 56 passengers aboard, two pilots, seven flight attendants on that plane. It plowed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center at approximately 9.08 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And then American Flight 77, bound from Washington Dulles to L.A., 58 passengers aboard, four flight attendants, two pilots. It plows into the Pentagon at approximately 9.30 this morning, just outside Washington. And finally, United Flight 93, it was going from Newark to San Francisco, 38 passengers aboard, five flight attendants, two pilots. It crashes into western Pennsylvania at approximately 10 o'clock this morning. Immediately, the government shut down all commercial air traffic until at least noon tomorrow. It disrupted trains, Greyhound buses, uh, commercial boat traffic. The borders were closed, and so it is just it is shut down transportation in this country virtually, Brian, uh, until at least uh, sometime tomorrow morning, and for the air traffic system until noon tomorrow at the earliest is what they're telling us here at American Airlines. Jim Cummins out in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you for that, Jim. And joining us now from Los Angeles, former U.S. Secretary of State Warren Christopher, who served, of course, in the first Clinton administration. Mr. Secretary, good evening to you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Brian. Do you regard what happened today, as some have called it during the day, an act of war? Yes, I think it is that, uh, Brian. You know, a, a mind searches for analogy in this situation, and I've lived long enough to remember Pearl Harbor. It's a event of that mention of this day like that one will live long and infamy as uh, president roosevelt said mr secretary what then should happen what should the threshold be in the process of finding out who's responsible who did this well i think we have to be calm and focused bring clarity to the situation we have to make a very very thorough investigation of the situation and brian it's important not to get just to the immediate perpetrators but to get to those who supported it. This event required uh, coordination, integration, a great deal of financial support, a great deal of planning. It wasn't done by one or two people. It wasn't done in a back room. So we not only need to find out who did it in the United States, but what their supporters were abroad. One thing I would caution against is jumping to conclusions. As you may remember, in the Oklahoma City bombing, everybody thought for several days that it then come from abroad. And, Perhaps we should take a lesson from that and work through this very systematically. But when we find out, then we're going to have to act with great, great precision and, and great definiteness. Is there any evidence uh, that it is uh, that is 
foreign terrorism per se and not domestic terrorism, given the clockwork-like timing of it all? Uh, we don't have any evidence of that right now at all. Now, evidently, probably our intelligence agencies have some beginning evidence on the subject, but one would have to say, just without pointing any figures, that there's been a massive intelligence failure, a massive security failure for this to have happened at four airports in the United States, three, possibly four airports, and for it to have happened with all this planning means that we really were lax, much as we were in the days before Pearl Harbor. The president has been handed, of course, a national tragedy, the likes of which the uh, president hasn't had since about uh, FDR, by my reckoning. If you were counseling him tonight, uh, what points does he need to touch on for an anxious American viewing public? I think you have to emphasize the importance of being unified, and we will be unified behind him. He has to emphasize the importance of getting to the bottom of this, and as I said earlier, not just getting the immediate perpetrators, but finding out where the support came from, where the financing came from. And I think he also has to find a prescription for the future so Americans will once again feel safe. People are not going to ride on airplanes for some time without uh, feeling a great deal of insecurity or go into big buildings. Now, America can't live like that for long. We will come back from this just as we have from other tragedies, but it's going to take a great deal of presidential and national leadership to once again make us feel safe and secure. I doubt that uh, this day will uh, ever be forgotten. I think we've reached a defining moment. Things will be different in the future. Uh, when you say things will be different, and beyond the fact that uh, flying domestically and overseas might take longer, what, what form will it take, do you think? I think there will have to be a good deal of more security surveillance around the country. We'll have to step up our intelligence. Uh, we'll have to find additional ways. And also, Brian, we need to recognize that this is an international problem. The terrorists uh, plan in one country, do their dastardly acts in another country, and flee to a third country. So we need to have a coordinated international response. We can't do it alone, but the United States has to take the lead. You're a veteran attorney. What, uh, what about when uh, that increased surveillance, increased security, runs up against the Bill of Rights? Well, we've been able to solve those problems in the past. Uh, Brian, I think there will be an awful lot of cooperation from uh, the American people and the courts in recognizing that this is a dire American emergency and one that we'll, uh, we'll have to do it within the context of our Constitution, but I'm confident that we can. I want, you to, I want to get you on record on the uh, uniquely American ability to put party labels aside and fall in line behind the chief executive during times of great national strain? Well, we've done it over and over again, and clearly we will do it this time, as we have so often in the past, as we did uh, in 1941 after Pearl Harbor, as we did indeed uh, after the riots in 1967 and 68. We recognize that we're in a situation where we're going to have to act together, we're going to have to act to be unified, and put partisan bickering to one side uh, as rapidly as we can. Is there anything worse about this vis-a-vis -vis Pearl Harbor in that we still don't know who the enemy is? Yes, that's certainly right. Uh, there you had a, you could focus on a particular enemy, find ways to combat this, but uh, them, but under present circumstances, we're going to have to take some time and find out who did it and how to react. Uh, well, Mr. Secretary, uh, after what's been a, a, a very uh, a, a tough day in this country, when you uh, look back at the events of the last couple of hours, uh, you look at uh, what had been passing for domestic political issues, in addition to this changing day-to-day -day life in the country, do you think this will change the access of the entire argument? Do you think this will increase now interest in things like your stock and trade foreign affairs? Uh, there's no doubt that it will. I think we're going to have to understand where this came from. We're going to have to understand who our enemies are around the world. And we're going to have to understand who our friends are. I would hope and expect that all the civilized world will join us in combating this. not just our NATO allies, but China and Russia as well. We need to get together in the civilized world to combat this. And in, on Capitol Hill, I think there will be a whole new set of issues. I don't expect to hear much talk about uh, what happened to the surplus in the, in the coming days.
Do we get too lax? Uh, do we get too carried away with the end of the Cold War? Uh, yes, I think there, there was some laxity, much as there was before Pearl Harbor. We perhaps were too confident about uh, we are a long ways away from the terror of the Middle East. I'm not saying this came from there, but it bears many of the earmarks of that. Uh, four suicide bombers or groups of suicide bombers, because those planes probably weren't taken over by a single person. You can just imagine what went on on board those planes. So it bears some marks of a society, a, a group of people that we simply don't understand and can't comprehend. But that doesn't mean we can't take full action in, in meeting it, even though we may not be able to comprehend it tonight as we sit in our stunned uh, concern for the people of New York and Washington, D.C. Former Secretary of State Warren Christopher, as always, sir, sir, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Brian. For those of you watching us on the NBC Television Network, stay tuned for a special 90-minute edition of NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. For those of you with us on MSNBC on cable, stay with us for uninterrupted coverage of this attack. I'm Brian Williams, NBC News. <laughs> Attack on America, a special edition of NBC Nightly News. Terrorists declare war on the United States, hijacking jetliners, crashing them into New York's World Trade Towers. Another airliner into the Pentagon, threatening the seat of national power. Thousands likely dead, downtown New York in chaos. America wondering, what next? on Midtown Manhattan, and tonight America is at war with terrorists after a stunning series of attacks today against targets in New York and in Washington, D.C., the World Trade Center, and the Pentagon. The terrorists use hijacked civilian airliners and their passengers as guided missiles in their attack, the most serious attack on this country since Pearl Harbor, and tonight the dead still are being counted. An unknown number still are missing. At this hour in this war, another development, there are reports out of Kabul tonight, the capital of Afghanistan, of explosions. But the Pentagon and the CIA are flatly denying that the United States had anything to do with those explosions. This has been one of the darkest days in America, and it is not yet over. Here at home now, a quick look at the locations where the four airliners hit. The Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan 20 minutes apart. Then, within an hour this morning, the Pentagon. And then, the final crash just minutes later, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, 266 people on the four airplanes alone, all presumed to be dead. At the World Trade Center, even nine, more than nine hours now after this disaster began, officials do not know how many people were killed, how many still are trapped in all the rubble. We do know that on most days there would be at least 20,000 people at work in the World Trade Center at the time that the airliners crashed into those twin towers. Another 90,000 could be expected in the vicinity of those towers in the course of an average workday. And of course, scores of police, firefighters, and other emergency personnel were in the area when the buildings came down. We're gonna get the view now from the White House and our correspondent there, Campbell Brown, also from the Pentagon and from Jim Mikloshevsky. And I'm going to join now with a complete account of what this day has been like from NBC's David Bloom, who's been my colleague all day long. David, bring us up to date. Well, Tom, more than nine and a half hours since the first attack, the smoke billowing from the hulks behind me is now more gray than black, indicating that the fires have diminished somewhat, but it's still an extremely dangerous situation. Just within the last hour or so, a third building a 40-story building also collapsed. 40 more stories of concrete, steel, and iron crashing the ground. A makeshift morgue has been set up near the World Trade Center. New York City police still stacking to their early estimates that the casualties ultimately may number in the thousands. Nothing more precise than that. We put together a chronology of the events as America's watched, dumbfounded, and yes, outraged and defiant. The first attack plane, a hijacked American Airlines flight out of Boston, slams into the North Tower of New York's World Trade Center at approximately 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time. The explosions and fireballs broadcast live by television helicopters, which then horrifically spot the second attack plane, a United Airlines flight hijacked from Boston, taking dead aim at the World Trade Center's South Tower. 
It's now approximately 9.03 a.m. Where the hell can I meet you? Oh, I'm across the street from the Marriott, man. A second airplane, a 727 just ran into the building. Emergency officials estimate 20,000 or more people may have been inside the two 110-story buildings at the time of the attacks. Eyewitnesses report victims falling, and in some cases, jumping from the two buildings. But there were people falling out of the sky. At 9.29 a.m., President Bush in Florida addresses the nation for the first time. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. But in the nation's capital, just 11 minutes later, 9.40 a.m., a third hijacked plane, an American flight out of Washington, Dulles, crashes into the Pentagon in a burst of flames, the plane's wreckage tearing a gaping hole into one side of the building. Federal buildings are evacuated, government leaders taken to secure hideouts. 9.59 a.m., the until now unthinkable, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. An unknown number of people still trapped inside, including the rescuers, firefighters and police who'd gone in trying to save lives. Then at 10 a.m., hundreds of miles away in western Pennsylvania, a fourth hijacked plane, a United flight out of Newark, crashes 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. One half hour later, 10.28 a.m., the north tower of the World Trade Center collapses. Rubble, debris spreading for blocks. In all, 266 people aboard four hijacked planes are killed. Untold others in Washington and New York missing and presumed dead. In New York, a defiance, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. The city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists. For the first time in U.S. history, the Federal Aviation Administration closes all domestic airports, shutting down all U.S. airspace until at least noon tomorrow. The U.S. military and American embassies worldwide placed on the highest alert. Navy aircraft carriers and destroyers deployed along the eastern seaboard. The president, now in Louisiana, speaks for a second time. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. The president is then taken to the secure Strategic Air Command in Nebraska meets with his national security team via teleconference before boarding Air Force One to return to Washington. But in New York late this afternoon, a third damaged building, the 40-story World Trade Center number seven, also crashes to the ground. And emergency officials allow the first camera crew from NBC News inside the smoking hulks of the Twin Towers. Ground zero, cars overturned, steel torn apart, glass shards, small fires still burning. The very picture America most feared, the image terrorist most wanted. As to who might be responsible, a senior American intelligence official tells NBC News tonight that they are now, and I'm quoting here, 90% certain that Osama bin Laden, the Saudi born terrorist, was responsible for today's attack. This official tells NBC News, quote, this is not just surmise, this is new information. The president plans to address the nation from Washington, D.C. tonight. Tom. Thank you very much, NBC's David Bloom. And we're going to go now to Washington, where NBC's Campbell Brown, who covers the White House, is on duty.